So uh, today we're going to talk about GraalVM. Uh, and I'm very happy that uh, you all chose this session rather than went into building chatbots. So my name is Alex Schleif, and I work for Oracle Labs. Uh, and I'm a de uh, developer advocate for uh, project GraalVM, which is a high-performance polyglot uh, virtual machine. Uh, and we're going to spend next 44 minutes talking about uh, what it can do for you, or how it's different from uh, normal JVM uh, or other runtimes, a little bit about uh, the architecture and the key terms and components in the GraalVM, and then I'm going to try to show you some demos for what is possible. Hopefully, we'll all agree that before GraalVM, that was completely impossible, so it should be an amazing advancement in, in technology. So before we start, please don't make any forward-going business decisions based on the contents of this presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, let's start. So currently, the world is uh, absolutely clearly polyglot. Uh, there are many programming languages, and every, almost everyone uses different several programming languages in any given project. So uh, even if you were mostly working, say, on a typical Java web application and you uh, kind of identify as a Java developer, how many of you are Java developers, mostly? Who uses other languages, mm, Java, some JavaScript, SQL? Fantastic. So those three would be kind of like more or less de facto set of languages that uh, a backend developer or like a full stack developer would use. There are also JVM languages on top of that. There are some, some programs are better written in native languages like C, C++. So the chart here, what you see is the Tayobi index for programming language popularity. Uh, and it lists top 20 languages. Java is on the first spot for many years now. Second, third spots are taken by C and C++. Uh, a little bit surprising is if you add those two together, they actually the share overcomes Java's. But in general, you can see that there are many languages. They're all popular. There are very many developers in the world. And we always choose, we try to choose tools that are best for every particular problem, right? So we, sometimes we do use languages because we just like those languages. Uh, but mostly we use, say, JavaScript when we think we will be the most productive at solving a particular task in JavaScript. Right? So for example, writing front-end applications, probably it's easier uh, to do in JavaScript. So many languages, they all have different properties. Uh, they are all popular. We would like to support more and more of those. With the languages uh, also come the ecosystems for those. There are every, every language and every uh, platform ecosystem contains modules and libraries and packages that are written by the community for that specific language. Right? In, in Java, we have the Maven Central. Uh, in JavaScript, uh, people use NPM. Uh, there are packages for Python and R. And, and all those libraries is the code that smart people wrote before, and it works, and it solves particular problems. And what you often have to do as a developer is just pick the correct library, use it correctly, glue together code from different libraries to actually solve the business problem that you're trying to solve to add value to your project. You don't need to re-implement details often, but you just reuse the libraries. So it would be very great if we could leverage all those ecosystems together uh, inside a single runtime. But it's not possible. So we have this separation, and that's why we identify very often as uh, developers in a particular programming language. Uh, so for a long time, I was a Java developer. And then I uh, became a developer advocate. So next question, uh, when we talk about different programming languages, is always uh, the performance of, of the programs we write those in. We would like our code to be fast. We would like to, it to be efficient. 
we would like it to consume as little resource as possible, especially if you are running your programs uh, on someone else's hardware, somewhere in the cloud, where you have to pay for the resources you consume. We would like to, the programs to be as cheap at operations time as possible. So for that, we need programming languages which produce programs that are fast and efficient. The problem is that only the runtimes are fast when somebody put a lot of resources into making them fast. Right? JVM is a, is, a, is a great platform. Uh, very many companies spend tons of resources into making it state-of-the-art, high-performance platform, uh, virtual <laughs> machine for running your code. Uh, V8, the JavaScript runtime, is fast because Google put a lot of effort into making it fast. Typically, if you just take a language uh, and you will have the runtime for that, it won't be particularly fast out of the box in the beginning, just because you have to invest a lot of money, a lot of time and resources into making the runtime for the language fast uh, for a new language. Now, you would like to have uh, the ability to interrupt between different languages. We very often, we currently do that uh, when we write small components of our systems in different languages, and then we put the network boundary between those, and when, then we send data back and forth through the network, and we call that microservices. And it's a great concept because it allows us to specify different components of the system in the languages that suit those particular components well. Right? If you have some microservice that does some machine learning, maybe you would like to write that in Python or R or some language that's better suited for machine learning. And then you just call it over the network. But for that, if you do this, you isolate the components into their separate boxes. So you lose performance because you need to serialize the data between the components all the time. Even if you don't go through the network, but you have, the, say, a dynamic language like JavaScript and a native extension uh, to speed up the p critical paths of the code, you still will need to convert the data between the representation between of those two. So if you use multiple languages, there will be a serialization cost. And the last but not the least important is when you have multiple languages, you will have different tooling for those. There are specific debuggers for the languages. There are specific performance profilers for different languages. Uh, and they work differently. So you need, you need to understand how to use those tools. You need to have developers which are uh, aware how to use those tools, have expertise on using those particular tools. And that kind of limits the ability of what we can do uh, as a single team. So GraalVM is a project at Oracle Labs that would like to solve those problems and create a single runtime that is really great at running all languages. And Oracle Labs itself is a research and development facility at Oracle. And our goal is to, well, research what's possible uh, in the uh, in IT and in computer science, and then successfully transfer the, that knowledge that we kind of researched and figured out into industrial projects. So other developers could use those and hopefully uh, turning them into successful projects, meaning that the company will, will benefit from that as well. So GraalVM, the answer of GraalVMs to those things is that all the languages should run with high performance out of the box. So there should be no specialization, no, not that much time should go into implementing language for that to be fast. So it should be a universal runtime virtual machine for all the languages. All languages should operate on the same data, and they, there should be zero overhead for calling between different languages. So if you would have a polyglot runtime where you, for example, would have a JavaScript application calling into your R function to create, to run some machine learning or something. You don't need to convert and serialize the data. And at the same time, GraalVM like, uh, likes to pose itself as the language virtualization lever, level. So we would like to treat all the languages the same and offer this intermediate layer for tools 
for other tools like debuggers or profilers to hook in and then they would all work for all the languages alike. And uh, yeah, those are three main benefits of using RealVM. And it sounds kind of magical, but it's actually uh, a real project. It has been in development for, uh, I think, around more than seven years now. So it's a very mature project. We just recently started converting that into the industrial project. Uh, we, in April, we released GraalVM 1.0 RC1, <laughs> which communicates the intent to release 1.0 at some point of, of time in the future. But we would like to gather feedback from the community and understand actually that GraalVM current, the, in the current state, GraalVM is sufficient to, to be used in the industry for actual real world applications. As I said, it's, it's, since Oracle Labs is a research and development facility, uh, most of the things that we are doing are also published in the peer-reviewed uh, journals and conferences. So it's an actual research thing. Uh, if you would like to have a deeper understanding what how GraalVM operates from within, what are the uh, optimizations that they, it applies, uh, probably the, current, the, the best paper, academic paper to read would be the practical partial evaluation for dynamic language runtimes. Uh, it came out somewhere in the summer, I think, last year. And from there, you can follow the references back to kind of to, to go through the articles and see how the Grail VM kind of creation was done. And you will have access to other references where you will learn what Grail VM can do and how it does it. So uh, it's a very interesting project. What, what, it, what it looks at, since we are talking now that we would like it to, to be an industrial project, uh, what, it, what components it has. So GraalVM, it's a, it's a virtual machine, right? It's a runtime. So somewhere, uh, as a user, if you would be an end user of GraalVM, you would run the command line, something like Java, and you will specify what program to run, and it will run that program for you. So, and since... It's a uh, GraalVM builds on top of the JVM on the normal hotspot Java virtual machine. Uh, currently on 1.8, some release of uh, Java 8. And the main component of the GraalVM is the compiler. Because to be able to run languages fast and programs fast, you need to compile them into an efficient machine code. So GraalVM offers the Graal compiler that integrates with the JVM through the JVM CI uh, Java Virtual Machine compiler interface that was added in Java 9 and then backported to Java 8. And it's a normal compiler. It's a third-party uh, normal compiler for the Java Virtual Machine. So it can natively compile Java bytecode and run it inside the JVM, right? So just through the, having the compiler, GraalVM can run Java code or code for any JVM language. So Scala, Kotlin, Groovy, uh, something else. Kotlin, did I say Kotlin? It's very interesting right now. People love Kotlin. So uh, JVM languages are supported out of the box. Now, for other languages, you need special support. And there has been, in the past, there has been some effort for creating runtimes for to be suitable for multiple languages, right? The JVM itself is a runtime that can, like you can compile most languages to Java bytecode, and then you run it on top of the JVM. The problem with that is that only languages which are similar to Java will run on the JVM well, right? If you, if you have different patterns of bytecode that are produced by different languages, you will, you will run it a little bit less efficiently. So to have support for different languages, GraalVM introduces the layer of indirection. All problems in computer science can be solved with a, adding a layer of indirection, except having too many layers of indirection. But, so GraalVM offers 
the component called Truffle Framework. So Truffle is a framework for creating managed languages. And what it, offer, what it is, it's an API for creating interpreters for the languages. So uh, you have the API to build the abstract syntax tree of your uh, program in your language. And then Truffle can operate and integrate with Graal compiler to compile that very efficiently into the machine code. So to implement the language support on top of Graal VM, one just uh, someone needs to implement the interpreter for that language. So if you took a compilers class uh, in, in, in school or university, or if you try different programming languages, you kind of probably have some sort of understanding of an, what an abstract syntax tree is. It's a, it's a tree where every node specifies an operation and you evaluate children nodes first and then you use the results of those to evaluate the root node. And it's the it's it's first step to implement in almost any language creation. So with GraalVM, that is also the last step. As soon as you have the interpreter for the language and it's implemented through Truffle, it's immediately, it can be used on top of the JVM and it will be a high performance language and it will run really fast. Currently, there are several implementation, official implementations of languages for GraalVM. We have JavaScript implementation called GraalJS and it also com comes with Node.js implementation. So Node.js is the set of API to run Node programs uh, and that is included in GraalVM. GraalVM also has Ruby implementation R and Python. Uh, in 1.0, running JVM languages and running JavaScript is considered stable and mature and ready for production. Uh, R, Ruby, and Python are in experimental mode. So they can run programs, they can run snippets of code, but there are some corner cases that we would like to figure out. So if you are going to try that, please Tell us what you think and submit any feedback. Now, on top of the Truffle framework, one even more interesting thing, GraalVM is able to run native languages on the JVM. So we have built a bitcode, LLVM bitcode interpreter. So LLVM is a compiler tool chain that you can use to compile your native applications, say a C application, a C++ application, uh, into this intermediate representation called LLVM uh, bitcode. And then normally that bitcode will be compiled into a native executable through the LLVM compiler, like Clang. But GraalVM can execute that on top of the JVM through an interpreter for this LLVM bitcode. Which is very surprising that uh, the speed at which GraalVM can execute LLVM bitcode is very close to the speed of the native executables because we can optimize the interpreters very well. So this is the picture, this is the current ecosystem of what GraalVM can run and, and, and what it supports. Now, under the hood, if we talk, if you think, if you want, would like to know the main thing why GraalVM is so efficient at compiling those uh, abstract syntax tree interpreters for languages into efficient machine code. The main two things are is that it em employs heavy specialization and partial evaluation of the code, two main optimizations that it runs. What it means is if you have an uninitialized program uh, in the beginning of when you run program, GraalVM just sees that as a typical tree of operations and you need to execute the children first. And it has no information about the profile of your program. It has no information about the types of the values flowing through the program. So it will interpret that. But after it gathers the profile, it knows, for example, that some nodes only receive strings as inputs, or some values are only integers. Through that information, what GraalVM can do, it can build a different copy of this particular piece of the tree and say that now my nodes will be of the integer type. Now that code, because we know the types, we can then compile into a very efficient piece of machine code and create a tightly coupled, like a larger node that contains more information and more operations in, in a single 
uh, in a single node evaluation step, so to speak. If at a runtime you will see a different profile or say we have integer nodes but we'll receive a string value, then the decompilation phase will, the optimization phase will run and then we'll get back into the interpreter, gather more profile and recompile the code again and again and again. So it, it is very efficient at running and compiling interpreters into the machine code. It can also de-optimize when needed. Oh, the only thing that you need to do is to provide it enough cycles to warm up and, and then it can run it very efficiently. So now we're gonna, we have 25 more minutes and I'm gonna try to show you some demos, which hopefully will run nice and fast and hopefully will show you what GraalVM is and give you a feel of those. So I hope you can see this GraalVM. I downloaded that from the Oracle Technology Network and it looks like a normal JDK, right? So I have my GraalVM, I have my home directory, and if I look in the bin directory, I see the normal JDK uh, commands, right? I see the JAVAC, I see the Java command, I see Java P, JCMD, and so on. I also see additional commands like JavaScript or LLVM interpreter uh, or Node. Those are all the executables, and one GraalVM distribution is able to run all those languages and commands efficiently. So, since most of you, I guess, there are more people now here, but most of us are writing Java day to day, right? Java developers? Okay, cool, Java. So let's look at a very simple benchmark for Java code. Uh, let me show you, I have a very simple benchmark it's written using the Java uh, micro benchmark harness. This is the benchmark that just has one method uh, and what we do, we stream the values and when, then we repeatedly map small functions on top of those uh, and we reduce all those uh, values back into a, a sum of integers. So this is a typical code that you will find in Java 8 and later projects using the streams API. Uh, this is a, a normal Java code, right? So to, in order to run this, I have two files. Uh, and I will show you what the first one looks. It's called run sh. What it does, it just executes the normal Java found in the GraalVM distribution and then it runs the benchmark files. So I also have the run no, bench, uh, no Graal thing. Since Graal compiler is a normal JVM CI compiler, I can disable that at any time just by providing the minus uh, use JVM CI compiler flag to my JVM, and then the JVM will see that I don't want to run the JVM CI compiler, so I don't want to run Graal, it will use the normal hotspot, CT compiler. So if I run this on my machine, uh, not the most comprehensive or scientific benchmark, it runs. GraalVM just recently got supported by the JMH as the uh, supported version of JVM. So we work well with the, all the annotations, the compiler hints and everything that, that is needed to create a meaningful benchmarks. In any case, don't trust the run of individual benchmark. Always run your, use, run your own tests, especially to measure performance, because whatever the results you see are just data, and what matters most is the interpretation of that data, understanding why things are fast or slow. At the same time, uh, trust the data as well. So now I run this benchmark without GraalVM. Right, so without the JVMC compiler and the normal hotspot has a score of 185 nanoseconds per operation. So to run one iteration of, of this method, it takes 185 nanoseconds. So now I will run the same benchmark, but with GraalVM. Who thinks it will be faster? Who thinks it will be slower? Why would I show you that GraalVM is slower? <laughs> so, but the question is, how much faster do you think it will be? This is the JVM we're talking about. So it's a highly optimized runtime, right? It's fast already. In the JVM world, one, two percent performance increase is a big deal. 
So who thinks it will be faster, like 5%? Don't peek there. Don't look at the numbers yet. 10%. We need to spend 20 more seconds for the iteration to finish. But you can see, you can see even currently, uh, with a sufficient warm-up, GraalVM can optimize this benchmark to run a single iteration of this test method in something like 10 nanoseconds. Normal hotspots run that in 185. So that's what 10, 15, 20 percent, uh, percent, 20 times increase in performance. This should not be taken for granted that any code will be 20 times faster running GraalVM. But what you should take from this is that there are pieces of code that GraalVM can optimize way better than the current hotspot. So, and this is not the code that was constructed specifically to be kind of nice for GraalVM. It's a normal just uh, usage of stream API. So what I encourage you to do is to, when you get back to your normal day-to-day -day jobs, and if you remember about this presentation, and you download GraalVM, you can just run it. If you have benchmarks or performance tests, you can see what kind of input, uh, what kind of performance boosts, if any, it will produce in your code. Uh, and see if you would like to use it or not. So this is the uh, fast, high-performance Java. Another thing that I would like to show you is being able to run polyglot applications. And I need to speed up it a little bit. So I have a different directory here with my different application. As you can see, it's JavaScript, Java R application. To run this, what I'm doing, I'm running the node executable. Uh, and I'm saying that I would like to run it with the access to the JVM and with the access to R and just specify the file. Now, if we look at this code here, this is the, no, not this. Uh, uh, to, 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 to polyglot application, server file, excellent. So this is a typical Node.js application. What, what it has, it has code specified in JavaScript, obviously. So I have my JavaScript code. With GraalVM, what I can do, I can have access to the Java class system and the types inside the JDK. So for example, we have access here to big integer. What I can do next, I can mix code written in JavaScript and code written in Java. So using Java, uh, Java API. Not only you can use the normal JDK classes, but also you can provide your own jar files onto the class pass, and you will be able to use those classes inside your JavaScript applications. So you can, if you, for example, would like to rewrite your uh, legacy Java monolith application in JavaScript uh, for, for reasons, uh, you can just load all that application into the node application that you're starting from scratch and reuse business logic and rewrite your application piece by piece rather than rewriting everything from scratch uh, immediately. What you can also do, you can use the Polyglot API to evaluate snippets of code or files in other languages. So currently in this example, we evaluate a snippet of uh, R code and we evaluate another snippet of R code, and you can see that we just append everything to the text variable in the JavaScript. So we declared the var text. This is the JavaScript variable. Then we added a string, a Java string to that. So we just say uh, big integer, do some computation to string. We get the Java string back. We append that to the text. We evaluate some R string, and then at the end, this snippet of code evaluates to an SVG image, so it's a, it's a XML of an image, and then we send the response back to the browser. Uh, since our application has started, let me just show you that it works initially. Uh, Localhost 3000. Let me, let me. It starts a little bit on the, first, on the first run because it needs to warm up the compiler itself, it needs to warm up and optimize the 
application, but you can see that it generates exactly the thing that we asked it to. So there is a string that we generated to JavaScript. There is a large number that we generated uh, using big integer in the, uh, from the JDK classes. And then this is an SVG image that we generated using R. And you can see when I just refresh the page, you can see that the stars realign. So it generates new plot, and it's fairly fast at this point in time. So it loaded the libraries once at the startup, and that took a little bit of time. But after that, it's highly efficient and fairly fast. So the best thing is that all that code is compiled without the regard of what language is written in. So it can compile into efficient code through language barriers. So it can inline pieces of JavaScript code and R code together, if you would prefer to do so. You can also use the debugger for, for this thing, but I will not show it to you currently. If you would like to know about debugger more, there is an example uh, somewhere of the application on the GitHub, and you can check it out, and you can run it yourself and try it, or you can find me after the session, and I'll show it to you. But this, these were the demos for fast Java and Polyglot applications. If you were considering the performance, this is the slide from, uh, I think, from the paper uh, that I referenced before last summer. So some things have changed. On the industry benchmarks, GraalVM is fairly efficient. We can run normal Java benchmarks a couple percent faster than Hotspot. We achieve larger boost on other JVM languages. So for example, Scala benchmarks produce a larger performance boost. The reason for that is largely because Java code and the compiler, the Hotspot, they were growing together, right? So they know about which patterns uh, used more, which patterns optimized better, uh, and the benchmarks were also, the, the runtime was also growing with the benchmarks, right? So as soon as you start producing different patterns of the bytecode, uh, the compiler maybe is not as great at optimizing those. And since GraalVM works mostly at the high level of optimizations on the, without re optimizing particular small language constructs for every particular language, it achieves a larger performance boost. If we talk about dynamic languages, then, for example, GraalVM is way faster than Ruby, way faster than R. It's a little bit currently a little bit slower than the best specialization of JavaScript, so it's about 90% of the performance of V8. And it's also somewhere 95, uh, 85, 90% of the speed of native applications, which was the most surprising for me, because interpreting bit code it should be slower, right? Native code is very efficient. When we need to write the most efficient code, we turn to native languages. And we say that we sacrifice the development productivity and some security features and safety for having access to the low-level primitives and writing code as close to the machine as possible. Uh, but surprisingly, with a very high-level implementation of that running on top of the JVM, which is additional layer of abstraction, uh, you get very competitive performance out of that. So if you use any of those languages, try it. Another great thing that GraalVM can do is, so GraalVM, it's a high-performance polyglot embeddable runtime. So by embeddable, what it means that we wanted to create a runtime that you can use to run your code in any environment. So not just on top of the JVM, but also be able to provide your own environment with some components of the virtual machine and leverage GraalVM from those. So GraalVM, if you provide the thread shuttling for the concurrency primitives, if you provide the code caches and garbage collection implementation and some other minor things, it can run in any environment you put it in. So you can embed that in your native application or you can embed that in your Java application to run say, snippets of JavaScript, or JavaScript write it by the users or something, uh, or you can embed it into native images. So Graal VM team created Substrate VM project, which is an implementation of a virtual machine written in Java. 
and it, uh, it, it has a garbage collection implementation, code cache, thread shadowing, and all those things. Uh, but at the end, it can compile itself into the native image, into the native executable, just a blob of uh, machine code, right? So typically, you would run your Java code as in the picture on the left. You will have the pre-compiled hotspot implementation, right? Your pre-compiled code, and then your Java application will be dynamically executed on top of the JVM. Right, so it will load the classes dynamically, and it will compile that using the just-in-time compilation procedure. With GraalVM, you have the option to compile that ahead of time to the machine code. So now your application and JDK classes and classes of your libraries will be compiled ahead of time into machine code. As a result, you will have just a single file that you can execute. And uh, it will work with memory management, so there is a garbage collection. Uh, it will work with the bound checks and everything that you would expect from the JVM to work. And you can embed that native uh, compiled code in native applications. So on top of that, you can also, with GraalVM, run dynamic languages. So not only you can just compile your... It will still compile just the Java parts into the native image, and it will execute dynamic languages on top of that uh, dynamically, but... Uh, you still can execute JavaScript in the native image mode. So it, it will pre-compile some core parts of the application, but allow you to extend your application dynamically. And we'll get into the demo here. So one benefit of having that is that native applications, they start up really fast, instantly, and they have a lower memory footprint during runtime because it doesn't need to reload the whole JVM and load all the classes. So let me show you a quick demo here. So if I just open this uh, particular file, uh, say we have this Java class here, right? And it's a very normal class. What it does, it has the main method. Uh, it's a different class. OK, this class works as well. It's a, it has a main method. It creates the polyglot context for GraalVM. It creates a function specified it, it creates a JavaScript function, uh, which is the lambda here. And then it walks the file tree. And for every file, it executes this function specified as JavaScript. Uh, and it prints out some information about those files. So it's a normal Java application that does something with your files, right? What you can do, you can compile that. Let me find this here. You, you can compile this application using the Java. You will get the class file here. And then what you can do, you can use the native image command. Uh, you can use the native image command from GraalVM uh, distribution to create a native image uh, of that file. I, it will take a couple of seconds, something like 40 seconds on this laptop. So I will not implement that now. But you can see that I have two executables here. And if you, if you see the dates, I created them a little bit earlier today. So now what I can do, I can run that, uh, and I can, do, I can run that. And you can see that it actually runs, and it does exactly what needed. So it walks the current file tree, and it prints some information about, that, uh, about the files and the times for that. I can also do what I can do. I can, I can run this application using normal Java, because it's a Java application, right? What I can do now is I can time those two things. I can time those two things. So if I time uh, Java execution of that, it takes two seconds to run this application, right? And it's normal, because we need to start the JVM, load the classes, uh, warm up some things, and then uh, do other things. Now, if I time the execution of the native image here, ext, ext, no, ext, no, ext, no, I need dot, right? Yeah, if I time this, you can see that it starts almost instantly. So if you deploy your application uh, into the 
environment where low startup is important. For example, you are running your things on the cloud uh, and you're paying for every CPU cycle that is consumed by your application. You would like your application to start instantly and then when it's done processing the request, it, it just to wrap it down and then not worry about that. Where you are running serverless, right? You have the smallest piece of code that you possibly can imagine to do something useful, like a function. Uh, and you would like to create that function and spin it up and down as fast as possible. Uh, having the ability to create native images is a, is a big win. Of course, there are some limitations to what it currently can do. But there are also examples that non-trivial applications can be turned into native images. So we can turn Javac into a native image uh, for faster startup time. Uh, Scala compiler, I've seen people do some closure applications and building native images out of those. I think uh, HTTP server for Scala, also somebody created a native image of that. Uh, so non-trivial things will work, uh, and there are some limitations, but there are also some workarounds for to use that. So if you would like to use native images, uh, and you will try that, and it will, if it doesn't work currently, probably you are stumbling upon a limitation of something. So reach out back to us and tell us that you would like to do this particular application, and we'll be happy to help if it's possible. So. Now I have three minutes, and I have one more demo that I would like to show. So uh, this, is, this is the picture of the ecosystem currently. GraalVM is in the middle. It's a runtime that can run multiple languages. It can run it into multiple contexts. And whatever language you specify your program in, it runs efficiently. Uh, I think there should be a second slide. Yes. So GraalVM provides you with optimization tooling and interoperability between languages. Uh, and your code is just, you use the tool that is best for the current task, and you run it and execute on GraalVM. And you can see that it can be embedded in different things. And one of the most interesting things there is, are the databases. So GraalVM can be embedded in the database to run uh, Normal code, not normal code, code in, in languages other than PLSQL as stored procedures. How many of you know PLSQL? How many of you use a database? How many of you are just sleeping? <laughs> <laughs> so normally you would use a database. Normally, if you need to do processing in the database, you will write your stored procedures in PLSQL. And if you know how to do that, and if you, if you are happy with that, PLSQL is a great language. It has a history of being optimized and evolved over the last 40 years. So it's a great language. If you don't know how to write PLSQL, but you still would like to process your data in the database to avoid bringing it all to the like, service layer, now with GraalVM, you can write your stored procedures in JavaScript. Let me show you how, it's, how, it, how it works. So currently, there is a multilingual, multi-language multilingual engine, uh, and there are some experimental builds of Oracle database available. So you can download that from the Oracle Technology Network. It comes, uh, one form as it comes is a Docker container. So I started that container here called MLE Docker, and it spins up the Oracle database inside that container, and that database embeds GraalVM. So what I do now, I uh, SSH into this container, and now I have access to, to my uh, application. So I'm going to use this snippet file to, to be faster at typing things. Select one from dual. So to show you that there are no tricks, this is the proper Oracle database. There is also a plugin coming up for MySQL to embed GraalVM. So very soon you will be able to do the same thing with MySQL. Now, to run JavaScript, I need to install that into my application, into my database. I can do that by just creating, uh, uh, creating a normal uh, JavaScript application or normal, normal packages and installing certain packages from NPM. While it installs, I will show you 
what it is, what we currently I'm going to do. So I installed the package called validator, and I installed types for the validator. So uh, JavaScript packages, and let me show you the browser for the validator, npm validator. Right? It's a normal package available on the uh, NPM. What it does, it provides you with some utility functions for strings. Right? It can validate strings, for example, and can show if a string is an email, or there are other things that it can do for string validation. But this is something that you probably would, if you, have, if you deal with emails, you can write the validation logic in the PLSQL storage procedure in the database, but maybe you don't want to do that. So there is, in the NPM, there are half a million packages available. So they can probably do whatever you need to do with very limited uh, custom code. So what I can do, I can install my packages locally in, near my database. I can also install them outside of the Docker container if I need. And then what I can do, I can use the DB JavaScript utility to say, please install the validator module into my instance of Oracle database running with multilingual engine. You can see that it creates a bunch of functions for all the exported JavaScript functions that we have. Now, those functions are exported, and now they are part of my schema, and I can use them as normal uh, user-defined functions in my database. So now, with all that said and done, if I log in into my database again, and if I do select uh, validator is email, and say oleg at oracle.com from dual, I get the response back. What it does behind the scenes, it runs JavaScript code inside GraalVM. And since GraalVM is designed to be embeddable, it doesn't conflict with the database. So the database controls the code cache and thread shadowing and garbage collection. So all, like, it's naturally it's well embedded inside the database so it can run code efficiently. And then you get access to the functionality available in the NPM right in the database. To show you that there are no tricks, if I just do a different thing, select validator is email. Or like, not an email, right, from dual. This will be zero. So uh, zero meaning that it is not an email. You need to have the types uh, for your JavaScript functions, which is typically be provided by the um, add types package created for TypeScript, uh, because it's a statically typed superset of JavaScript. But most of the packages have the types declarations. You can also use that to install your custom JavaScript files, normal JavaScript modules, not from the NPM, but local. Just write your JavaScript and install that into your database. And you can run it. So, yep, this is the demo of running GraalVM inside the database. Uh, your code, everything. So, GraalVM, all in all, High performance polyglot language layer, virtualization layer, embeddable across the stack in native JVM based applications. There are a couple of companies who are using GraalVM currently. So, Twitter, for example, is using Graal compiler uh, in production for running their Scala microservices in the report. Uh, performance increase. So, for example, Chris Tallinger from Twitter engineering team. Uh, presents sessions at conferences. I think uh, the latest title that he uses is the Quest for Holy Graal Runtime, and he shows benchmarks and how they use that. Uh, Graal is an, the core of the Graal VM project is an open source thing. So there is a community edition. Uh, the binaries for that is available at GitHub. The source for components is available at GitHub. You can Download and use that for free. Uh, there is an enterprise edition that has a different, the same contract, but different compiler phases. So it is better at optimizing code. So certain programs will be faster with the enterprise edition, but they will be, e well, you will still be able to run them using the community edition of GraalVM. Uh, yeah, Twitter uses that. 
uh, and it's all open source on GitHub. So if you would like to learn more, there is an Oracle Technology Network page for Graal VM, uh, GitHub mailing lists where we would ha be happy to answer all the questions. Uh, recently created a website with more documentation and e examples how to use this. Uh, it's a very ambitious and vivid and lively project that hopefully will get more and more traction in the upcoming, I won't say weeks, but it will take months and maybe years. Uh, but it, it, it is a very interesting project and uh, hopefully you got a glimpse into what it can do and got interested in what it can do for your applications. If you did, then please go and check and download and try that uh, and then come back requesting features or reporting issues. Thank you. Time, so I don't think, I'm over time, right? Yeah, I'm over time, I'm very sorry about this. So I don't have time for official questions here, but you can come here and I will answer all the questions while I'm packing. And if you have questions, then you can find me in Twitter and ask there. Thank you.